You know what I'll do is I will um um your captain's name email Stuart right now to say when are we when when will our our budget be coming to the record? board for we're like ten and a half an hour or something. No, it was me. Okay. I would think it would be Janice. No, it was no? Yeah, what? Paul? What? I never watched it. Oh, yes, it was. The longest council meeting. I remember we were done yeah. like half an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let me, I let like me those. just... Um, I think Janice does pretty good ones. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, so that Pam did want to come and yes. okay. update council about that, so I don't know if that means they haven't read yet or... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Joanna's mother. 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 Yeah. yeah. I think send her a sympathy card. <coughs> Late 70s? <coughs> yeah, so I said cancer. Well, diabetes did, did my sister. Pneumonia uh, was the final. Yeah, it all starts to complicate. Uh, uh, Webex? Okay. Especially when you're away. Yeah, um, I know that Alex did it with some. Yeah, we'd have to. We'll have to. We have to do a test internally to see how it goes. CDC. Yeah, we can do that for sure. I didn't expect the generation. What's that? Through the oh, chamber in the middle of these Skip things. public participation. <laughs> <laughs> a little challenging. <laughs> but I am ready to roll. Got your clock out, Robin? <laughs> I don't have a clock. How are you going to know what time it is? <laughs> Guess. Come on. <laughs> oh, lights in the hallway went out. Oh, it's so dry. Or Panama? Zebra. Yeah, I'm doing the Panama Canal again with some friends that haven't been there. So. <laughs> I think you're right. From zebra. On a cruise. Cruise, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I can't think of the word. From Fort <laughs> Lauderdale to LA. Holy smokers. Yeah. How long does that take? 15 days. The last one I did was 20 days. Wow. Well, you know the lady that's doing the uh, well, just, public engagement? <laughs> watching me only talk a little. Someone I used to work Yeah, with. CBT. Like, She's, great. She's great. She's yeah. great. Does she still work for them? It's I think so, as a contract. Yeah, but I mean, it's a long ways to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I. Because yeah, um, you got to go all through the Caribbean. Yeah. Oh, right. right? You got to go all the way down there. And then you got to go through the canal. Which takes. Two days. Oh, does it? I mean, most of the time. Two days. Oh, it's like they have one. Um, yeah, I've got. Yeah, it's back up to. LA. For some reason, my iPad's phone is ticking me off because I dumped a bunch of stuff off it and it's yeah. still saying no. Yeah. Mm. Twit. Mm. Yeah. Technology's a diva. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and I gotta forward this to. Start one minute early. Hmm? Start one minute early. It's picking up your voice. I'm putting a camera on you. When oh. you're, when you're humming. <laughs> That's disconcerting. It's really it disconcerting. <laughs> I like you guys. It must, cause the mayor must be on that side of the room. It's like, yeah. Yeah. whisper. Just whisper. Because it doesn't come this way, so. Yeah, and the clarity. Well, it's picking up. The, it will. If you're talking, it just pick up our voices switch and come over, over here. Mm -hmm. Don't it? No. Yeah. No? It's supposed to, but it's not. Voice. It likes Bring the mayor. Over here. See? Oh, there. went in the middle. Yeah. Keep talking. Tell me about the Panama Canal again. Oh, you have to do in your Tell me a fishing story, Bob. See if it works. Camera here. Oh, it's not going to zoom in on you. No. no, here. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah, see, it doesn't. Oh, hi. Yeah, okay, there. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a little freaky to me. I don't know. Normally, they're not on. It's because we have some of their presentations. But the cameras but are, or the see, TVs are usually off. Or does that, or does that one camera pick up oh, does the it? speaker here? Uh, yeah, I'll switch. Oh, oh, it's getting you right now. I'll call a council meeting to order, and Mayor Kozak would like to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Acting Chair Sherbo. Thank you very much, Acting Mayor. Uh, before we begin our formal meeting this evening, I would just like Council to take a moment and, uh, and all of us to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of Carrie Dick. Carrie Dick was a very um, well-loved 
young man who just passed. He has uh, he has uh, three children. He volunteered amazingly, in, especially in the soccer community in the, for the city and for the uh, for all for a bunch of children. And um, unfortunately, he lost his battle with cancer. So, if we could just take a minute and just be silent for a minute to remember Carrie, that would be great. Thanks, Acting Mayor. Thank you. So I'll begin the meeting with our Aboriginal acknowledgement. The City of Nelson acknowledges all Aboriginal peoples on whose traditional territories we stand. We honour their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. I don't believe there's any lead items. So uh, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? Moved. Councillor Morrison and Councillor Purcell. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, our first item on the agenda is uh, Joey Baird and Sydney Black, CDC. Public participation. Pardon me? Public participation. All. Is that, sorry. Oh, sorry, close. Right. Anybody who's not part of the agenda, please come up if they wish to speak. So close, you can come up and I'll read the uh, City Council welcomes comments from the public on issues it is dealing with or other issues of interest to the public. Before speaking, please identify yourself and state your name and place of residence and the issue you're bringing forward. Please limit your questions and or comments to a maximum of five minutes. Council will not make any decisions at this meeting about the issue you raise, but may refer the item to staff for a follow-up. Topics raised in this session should be of broad public interest. Complaints of a personal nature will be dealt with by staff through the city's established com complaint process. Thank you for taking time to participate in the city council meeting. Go ahead, Klaus. My name is Klaus Schunke. I uh, live in Nelson. I want to talk about budget proposals for 2018. First, Cultural Development Committee, CDC. Under communication, the CDC's request states, quote, hearing the presentation educates council and the public about the CDC's budget, which assists the city's budget deliberations, unquote. This request states under Heritage Working Group, quote, unquote, priorities. Three heritage plaques, there's no description. Heritage celebratory events, there's no description, there are no numbers under quote-unquote programs, heritage award, heritage signage, no descriptions, no number. Summer heritage programming, no descriptions, no number. Heritage history talks, no descriptions, no number. The concept Nelson Heritage has thus far been used consistently only in the narrowest terms. For council and the public to become thoroughly familiar with these projects before funding is decided, it would be helpful to know in detail the bases, intentions, and parameters of said projects. Much of this... Wrong glasses. Much of this reads like a general project idea instead of a definitive budget proposal. Second, Chamber of Commerce, NDCC, Visitor Information Center. Educational aspects for council and the public apply here as well. While the NDCC request in itself seems thorough in promoting tourism commerce, there's absolutely no indication of the further-reaching socio-historical context of the CPR building's quote-unquote adoptive reuse of the heritage train station, unquote. Clearly part of a visitor information center. This request, as presented, only promotes commercial self-interests why should the general public fund this? Its educational value for all, including tourists, is limited. Third, Touchstone's Nelson Museum of Art and History, Vision, 
quote, an inclusive society inspired by the convergence of art and history, unquote. Mission, quote, to be a cultural hub that provides integrative art and regional history programs to encourage new perspectives and foster a collaborative community, unquote. While Touchstones envisions an inclusive society, its presentation here and work in general does not reflect it or all-inclusive regional history programs. The quoted economic impact study, 15 years old, with its references to art in connection with heritage, does here not clarify the concept of heritage beyond mentioning the vague, quote, considerable heritage appeal of its heritage buildings which is based on a very limited white Anglo-Saxon Protestant parameter only. With history part of its name, this organization has the responsibility to present Nelson's history comprehensively and accurately. Otherwise, what are counsel and the public learning and funding? Conclusion. Budget presentations of these three organizations are in part based on superficial criteria of habit, expected to be accepted by habit. Therefore, allocating public funds to them ought to be done in the most circumspect manner possible, economically and ethically. Thank you. Thank you. Council, have any questions? Well, thank you, Klaus, for your presentation. Okay. Does anybody else have a presentation that's not on the agenda? Okay, so I'll invite the city's cultural development officer, Joey Barrett, Did and you, CDD. Sorry, there's C somebody. So you another p person here. Oh, do we? Yes. Yep. Oh, sorry. <coughs> I'm Brenda Benedetti, and I live at the Amber Bay uh, Complex at 909 Radio Avenue. And I would like to discuss the pending movement of the SEEDS organization onto the 7th Street uh, Park. They call it a park down there. I don't know if other people are aware of this issue. Uh, the first thing, question that I would like to ask is uh, why wasn't the neighborhood consulted about this? I spoke with Chris Gain Gainham uh, of the parks uh, area, and he indicated it's because of the zoning down there that it's zoned for commercial and residential. Well, it's a densely populated area. There's 150 plus units down there. There's commercial, there's residential, and the SEEDS organization is a charity organization. So I don't quite see the fit with that <coughs> because uh, for the mandate for the city of Nelson is that um, they do things in the neighborhoods or in the city with consultation from the people. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that happening there. Uh, calling it a park is very generous because basically it's a green strip of grass beside Amber Bay, like our, our uh, properties are adjoining. So it's a strip of grass, it's got uh, parking, and, but it's not very big. A lot of the land is CPR land. And when um, the developer who did Amber Bay and Silver Bay uh, wanted to do the grain, the city uh, asked for this piece of property, which was an excellent move because it promotes like a lot of outdoor activity. It's the only green space in the whole area. And it also is positive for mental health reasons. And it's right across from the independent living property. So that was what I was told, but I take exception to that because it will impact the whole neighborhood. Um, the, uh, I, another question that I had is why wasn't there a city planner involved in this? You know, somebody who knows what the future development is in the area because there's pro uh, proposed development along the water. Um, and there's also a commercial development going on where there's going to be six rental units and four commercial spaces. And there were <coughs> quite a number of variances granted for that property where there um, is not enough parking. So it was reduced from 20 to 13. 
they've got a commercial loading zone which is very small, very dangerous, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I don't really want to talk about that. But that does create more congestion, congestion in the area. So the seeds operation, they're going to have their. Um, it's a chain link structure at the park and it's all enclosed in this fence and everything. They're going to maintain that and then they're going to be given the old greenhouse which they're going to reskin and they're uh, proposing to put it on that property. That to me is going to cause a lot of problems because although um, Natalie from planning uh, indicated to me that it was going to be a structure which was kept locked and it was also going to be um, all of their debris <coughs> sort of thing was going to be kept inside that structure. What it's going to do for the neighborhood is it's going to take wanted space away but it's also going to attract, well we, we have deer, we have skunks already but it'll attract um, coyotes, it'll attract bears, etc, etc. And when I brought that up with the people involved um, they sort of said, well, they're kind of aware of those issues, but, um, you know, they think it'll be okay because it's going to be a locked facility. But, you know, we have experiences with beer, bears at our cabin, and they, if they want the food, you know, they just, like, knock the structure down or knock the composter over or whatever. So I don't feel that that's a safe situation because the people from the village have on their own initiative put in like stepping stones uh, and they do a bit of uh, gardening, like not gardening like food, but plants, etc., etc. They enjoy going over there, there's a crosswalk there. So in order to make that um, greenhouse safe or to stop um, animals from going in there, they may, might be forced with into the situation of putting a chain link fence around it, which would take up more property, which would encroach upon the crosswalk and the already um, the stepping stones and the sitting areas and stuff like that. Uh, also, there's a lot of other people that use the area for dog walking, et cetera, et cetera. So where are they going to be walking their dogs now? They're going to be going um, down to John's Walk or they're going to be coming onto our property. Also, there would be expense involved because it would be a very congested area and we'd be calling the bylaws people, the police, because there's a lot of transients that go through that area to Red Sands, we'd be calling whatever. So money is lost there and I'm sort of asking the city if they could take a step back and have the planner involved, the parks involved, the seeds people involved and possibly take <coughs> that whole seeds operation and give it another plot of land. And the main, there's three options that I can see myself, but what the main option is the um, park. Uh, it's called Prince William Park. It's a substation park. It's a beautiful property. It has trees. It's got a nice southern exposure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They could take their compound at Lakeside Park. They could take it up there. They could take their greenhouse up there, and they'd be off occupying one whole area and not having to go from one one location to the other. Um, so that is what I'm looking for is some commitment from the city as they'll take a second look at the situation down at the 7th Street Park. <coughs> Anybody got any questions? Sir? Did Council have any questions? No. Okay. I, I just didn't understand the part about transients and calling by live. I don't know how that's relevant. Transients and? And having to call by law. I don't well, know what that has to do with the greenhouse. With the new commercial, six new commercial spaces going in, there's going to be a lot of congestion because they weren't, uh, they, they received a variance to reduce the parking. So there will be a lot of people coming and going. And uh, so we'll be having. Just regular. And no. There are a lot of irregular people that come down there from above Fieldby Road and they come down 7th Street and they walk their dogs. But there's a lot of the transient population that goes through the area, through the park and out to Red Sands Beach where they possibly camp for the night. There's quite a bit of that going on. Thank you, I understand. Anything else? So what we're looking for is the 
city to step back, bring the planner together and talk about the situation and maybe get the seeds organization a better spot so that they can put everything together. Uh, the parks uh, people will get that extra space at Lakeside Park. Uh, the seeds people will get both their operations in one location. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. So I'll try this again. Is there anybody else that would like to make a presentation before the agenda? So maybe third time lucky. <laughs> the invite the City Cultural Development Officer, Joey Barrett, and CDC Chair, Sydney Black, to present the 2018 budget for the Council's Cult Cultural Development Committee. Okay. No cultural presentation? Oops. Should be on the screen. We could do something right now. If you want. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking you should at least sing. I mean, we yeah, can get a cultural presentation. <laughs> Great, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Joy Barrett and I'm the Cultural Development Officer. And this is Sydney Black, who is the chair of the CDC. 2017 was an extremely busy and productive year for the Cultural Development Committee. We kicked off with a continuation of the Art Rental Program and initially launched in 2016. This program has had the positive impact of enlivening and beautifying the city's spaces while supporting and promoting local and regional artists and has proven to be hugely popular with the community. Funding for this program stems from the Public Art Reserve Fund and will be continuing in 2018 with the added feature of displaying historical objects in partnerships with Touchstones Museum of Art and History. Our public art initiatives are also very well received by residents who are eager to see the beautification of the city and also with visitors adding to the vibrant experience of Nelson and complementing the downtown heritage architecture. We lease five sculptures annually in our ongoing partnership with Castlegar Sculpture Walk and this rotating downtown gallery has been extremely popular with sculptures becoming meeting spots and photo ops. Flower Power, located in Railtown and on the left on your screen up there, has in particular received a great deal of positive feedback from the residents and was very well placed by Public Works. Now, additionally, this year the Kootenai Co-op will be joining the program and leasing a piece to place in front of their business. The CDC launched the Cultural Ambassador Program in 2009 to recognize and honor the tremendous creative talent we have here in the city. Our first recipients were the Corazon Youth Choir and we've since honored eight other artists in visual art, literature, music, video arts, and dance with dancer Slava Doval as the 2018 recipient. Applications and nominations for this program are increasing every year and further establishing Nelson's reputation near and far as an arts and culture destination which fosters and rewards creativity. Additionally, we partner with local cultural groups for the monthly cultural presentations to City Council and with the League of Canadian Poets to recognize National Poetry Month every April. In 2016 and 2017, we partnered with the Chamber of Commerce on a bilingual signage project for the Railtown Visitor Center, which received $18,000 in funding from the Francophone Affairs Program and was completed in 2017 along with the final reporting. We also received funding from the Francophone Affairs Program for the Economisee Project, which is an international cultural tourism initiative that draws on the rich historical tradition of arts and crafts to showcase local artisans, their methods, and their wares. This project is a partner, partnership between the city, the French Economic Development Society of BC, the Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center, Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism, and the Nelson and Area Economic Development Partnership. We will be creating a physical display at the Visitor Center that will act as a hub for visitors to Nelson and the region detailing local artisans and directing visitors to their studios where they can learn firsthand about the traditional history of the craft, watch the objects being made, and purchase the final product. 
We'll be installing and piloting the project with approximately five artisans this spring and foresee that in a few years this will be an extensive network featuring the large number of talented artists in our region and partnering with the nine other sites already in BC and over 70 internationally. Now on the left you'll see Shea Totosh who's uh, joining in the program and on the right is Lily and Coho which are also going to be a part of it. An exciting initiative we've embarked on in 2017 is three art and infrastructure projects. Mosaic Tile in three locations along Hall Street from IODE Park down to the lakeside and benches and railings at the future Hall Street Park development which you see in front of you now. Adhering to the city's art and public places policy procedures, a public request for proposals was circulated followed by an arm's length jury in which three artists were chosen, Nelson artist Nathan Smith for the railings, Revelstoke artist Lindsay Burke for the benches, and Winlaw based artist Carl Schlichting and Robbie Gonzalez for the mosaic tile. City of Nelson Public Works and the CDO, me, will work with the artists to develop and complete these projects this spring and summer and will publicize them when complete. Additionally, the CDC is enthusiastic about continuing work with the city on the downtown urban design strategy and rail town development and design. Other ongoing projects include the administration of the Community Initiatives, Arts, Culture and Heritage Funding, maintaining our current public art and heritage assets, and working with local and regional organizations to foster arts development and partnerships. <laughs> All righty. Um, so I'm just going to discuss. You can. Do I need to be really close? How close do you need to be on this thing? Pretty close. Okay. Sorry, Joy. I'm just. I'm like all up in your business. Um, in addition to our regular monthly meetings, the Cultural Development Committee has established working groups to further the, its initiatives. These groups consist of representatives from the local and regional arts community, including at least two CDC members. The Public Art Working Group reviews all public art matters, from the selection, placement, and maintenance of public art to the disbursement of the Public Art Reserve Fund. The festival working group, which includes members from Shambhala, the Kaslo Jazz Festival, Tiny Lights, NDAC, and the Eco Society, meets to discuss everything from festival organizers' needs, processes, marketing, and collaboration, to the creation of new arts and culture festivals. And the newly formed marketing working group will be working on collaborative marketing for the arts, culture, and heritage sector, and creating a cohesive identity for these groups in order to market the sector as a whole. No, we'd like to call Astrid Heyerdahl up to discuss the Heritage Working Group. Good evening. So the Heritage Working Group is comprised of heritage experts in the community, both from the CDC and without CD, from without the CDC. So we are so excited this year to award the 2017 Heritage Award to Greg Scott. And he's very deserving of this award. We had so many applicants this year, and it was a tough decision to make. But we really believe that Greg showcased really what it is to promote um, and care for the history and heritage of this place. We completed the Tanaha History Historic Marker Corrections. We provided guidance to city development staff on heritage signage. And we've also engaged with Jean-Philippe Stien to write two statements of significance. And Jean-Philippe is also the archivist and collections manager at Touchstones Nelson and is really getting to know the history of this place. What's really great too is we've done the Nelson History Talks series and we're going to continue this on in 2018. We've hosted two at Touchstones Nelson in 2017 and one at the courthouse. And we're going to continue in 2018 to showcase the different heritage buildings uh, throughout the city. So not just focusing on the post office, but throughout the city as well. We've also completed a heritage mural. So in partnership with the Youth Action Network and artist Amber Santos and a team of talented youth, we worked together to create a mural looking at Canada 150 plus, Nelson 120 and really engaging youth with history. This mural was up for a few weeks outside of the Capitol Theatre and what is really exciting is that it has longevity, it has a legacy to it. This piece has 
been installed at LV Rogers Secondary School. It will be there permanently and we hope to have a little launch party where everyone is invited to celebrate the fact that we really can engage youth with history and heritage and create exciting and challenging conversations around history. And what's great is even if someone isn't interested in history, they go into that room in LVR and they, and they see it up on their wall. So hopefully that will spark some conversations there as well. What was exciting as well is that we had Nelson Home Hardware contribute to the creation of that mural in that they supplied us with the paint and um, all of the materials in order to make the mural. In 2018, we will be developing three heritage plaques. One of the plaques is for IODE Park, and the other one will be for uh, Cottonwood Park, which will speak to heritage objects which will be on loan from Touchstones Nelson Museum permanently in the space to speak about the heritage of that site. In addition, the other um, plaque will be created at the Dog Walk Park close to the airport and so that we can showcase the history of another heritage object moved from Touchstones Nelson's collection to that space on permanent loan. Um, it's a propeller. And so again, we can speak to the history of the propeller of that object and then the heritage of that site by the water. We are working closely with the City of Nelson's development team, development staff, to look at the statements of significance, the priority list, looking at uh, potentially a review of the um, heritage support that we give to our, all of our buildings, the built heritage asset, ensuring that we're really working together as a team to ensure their protection. We will, of course, continue with a rail town plan and urban design strategy consultation with City and heritage celebratory events. What that really means is the fact that the heritage working group comprised of heritage experts will work together to plan and develop wonderful uh, events for Canada Day, for National Aboriginal Day, for Orange Shirt Day, for other events which really talk about the history and heritage of Canada as well as of this area. And truth and reconciliation is a large priority for us as well, looking at how uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has created calls to action for all of us together as citizens where we move forward with humanizing archives, with ensuring that museums and galleries are working towards uh, <coughs> responding to these calls uh, to action um, in, a, in a timely manner and working uh, collaboratively as a community. <coughs> So in this, the Heritage Working Group budget request is as follows. You can follow it on your screen. So for the a Heritage Award, every year we give an honorarium to that individual of $1,000. For the Heritage Signage, we believe that we can create these three plaques for $1,500. Summer Heritage Programming will, um, as I said, involve um, artists and um, other performers and dancers to come together to really celebrate history and heritage in the area for the community. Nelson History Talks, we uh, will continue with this program as said and we want to ensure that we are capturing those talks on video to be able to keep those for our archives and we also want to sure, ensure that we are um, not asking everyone to volunteer their time. So we are giving honorariums to those who are speaking. And um, statements of significance, each statement of significance is $250 for our expert to be able to go through the extensive research required to make that statement of significance. Canada Day programming and our annual Heritage BC membership, which is $100. Totals $6,000. Thank you, Astrid. And our Cultural Development Committee budget request for 2018 uh, includes the Cultural Development Officer's contract employment of $36,000, which has an additional 30 hours for the Cultural Development Officer. Uh, this is necessary to participate in development and public works meetings. Um, we've also found that it's necessary, it has been necessary over the last two years as we've had to, uh, to dip into the CDO expenses and miscellaneous area to ensure that Joy's hours are covered for the entire year. Um, this year was incredibly busy for her with all of the RFPs um, that happened. So uh, again, this is something that uh, that we have been using <laughs> up until now. But it would nice be nice to be able to uh, to utilize our CDO expenses and miscellaneous as they are supposed to be used, and not for wages. Um, we have uh, one thousand one hundred and fifty dollars that is uh, goes towards the cultural ambassador program. Uh, $2,000 uh, to support the CDO attending the Creative Cities Network Conference, uh, and then CDO expenses of $1,000 and miscellaneous of 
dollars. So our complete budget request from the city of Nelson is forty thousand nine hundred dollars, which is a two point two five increase. And we would just like to say that we have accomplished what we've set out to do with our limited resources, and with additional funds, we could truly cement our status as a thriving arts community. Um, it's it's really important to note that uh, with all of the hours that we can get Joy additionally, the more grants that she can apply for, the more funding that can be brought into the city, um, the more she can do for arts, culture, and heritage. So, thank you. That's a picture of me. <laughs> Two weeks postpartum. Uh, <laughs> uh, are there any questions at all? Council Warmington? Uh, could you remind me what the two statements of significance were? The two statements of significance were for the uh, rail town street oh, houses. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, do you have any others planned? Are there some on the list? We are working with Pam Moreau, who is the head of development of the city of Nelson, in order to establish the priority list for the statements of significance and uh, really ensure that we're working together as the heritage working group of the city to, to um, create that priority list for the statements of significance and also to ensure that we are really looking at all of the built heritage assets in the city and to see how the heritage working group can support the city to ensure that they are protected. Fantastic. Just not so much a question, it's just been great working with you, the little bit I have. And the idea that your focus on youth and engagement in youth and how important that is, you find that out when we do you know, the Nelson at his best and poverty things, that isolation is a, is a, causes a lot of problems with it, with young people and that you can get them out and you're focusing on that, so important. And also the partnerships that you're developing to make things happen. It's, it's great, it's been, it's great working with you. Thank you, Michael. Is that it? Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And Sydney doesn't have to go anywhere. I know, I'll <laughs> shimmy over, I don't have to lean. So, um, <laughs> Our Nelson and District Arts Council new Executive Director, Sydney Black, will present the 2018 budget for the Nelson and District Arts Council. She's making things happen on the computer. I'm like, what's going on? Who's doing that? I think it's Francis. <laughs> Slow. All righty. See, I did the fancy PowerPoint for you again. You guys look out. <laughs> All right, Acting Mayor Cherbo, City Council members, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Sydney Black. I'm the Executive Director of the Nelson and District Arts Council. The Nelson and District Arts Council was formed in 1969 as the Kootenai Columbia Arts Council. We are a registered nonprofit organization. We've had a fabulous two years. We've revitalized our organization, rebranded both the organization and our flagship Art Walk, and we've created a new website. In the last two years, we've doubled, more than doubled our membership from 38 to 99 members. Our board has increased from four to nine board members, and those board members are a lovely, diverse cross-section of our community members. Uh, in, we have a 2016 to 2018 strategic plan, uh, which sees renewed attention on artist development and support with three pillars of focus, producing events like Art Walk, Appetite for Art, and the Dance Educator Showcase, providing artist awards, bursaries, and support programs, and liaising with the city to advocate for artist needs in the community via the Cultural Development Committee, of which I am the chair, and maintaining active communication with the mayor. Um, providing these services to the artistic community strengthens the overall cultural climate of the region. The benefits are felt by all in the area, whether it be via economic stimulation, increased pride in one's community, um, or an increase in positive mental health. We are fortunate to live in a culturally rich area, and we must nurture those that make Nelson North America's best small arts town. Uh, in 2017, um, NDAC was involved in many partnerships, and we're looking forward to maintaining those relationships and connecting with more businesses and cultural groups in 2018. Uh, we were fortunate to work with Bigby Place, uh, the Public Library, Elephant Mountain, Oxygen, Road Kings, Touchstones, Nelson Clares, Blue Knight, there's so many, every dance school ever, um, and countless individual artists and businesses. And our vision moving forward is that the Nelson and District Arts Council is an inclusive organization that supports and promotes artistic and cultural diversity of the vibrant communities that we serve in Nelson and surrounding areas E and F. Picture time. 
All right. So Art Walk 2017. We had a really great Art Walk this year. There were 35 artists in 14 venues across town. We distributed over 5,000 brochures. Uh, we canceled our street closure this year, which drove patrons to the businesses, and we decided that we were going to provide live entertainment in each site for our opening. And this ended up bringing out about 700 people this time. Uh, so we went from a Canada Day opening last year womp, womp, to 700 people this year. It was super exciting. <laughs> let, let the yeah, let the minutes show. Wah, wah. That's a thing. <laughs> um, we paid out 43% more in artist fees this year than last year, which is great. And uh, we continued our youth initiative in partnership with the Nelson District Youth Center, which gives students experience with the process of applying and showcasing in an art show from start to finish. We had our second annual Dance Educator Showcase, which happened on November 17th. We had 82 dancers from eight dance schools in the community who came together and entertained a packed house at the Capitol. The profits from the evening were turned into NDAC bursaries and are available to all eight schools that participated. The schools are responsible for distributing the bursaries to students based off of financial need. The event was able to bring the local dance schools together, which is something they find difficult to do with their busy schedules. And in the last two years, we've raised $7,000 for dance classes for students and uh, we've done that for I think over a hundred people have taken advantage of those uh, bursaries so that's really awesome we're very proud of that uh, in the fall of 2016 we hosted an arts and poverty forum in partnership with the Civic Theater and from that roundtable conversation it was determined that a major need of all artists in the community is education on the business of being an artist so in collaboration with the Civic Theater and with the support of the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council we provide artists with a free weekend symposium featuring speakers from the business community uh, such as a business consultant insurance broker grant writing expert marketing expert social media expert and more we also hosted two roundtable conversations uh, these events occurred as a part of Nelson's culture days celebration uh, one of our roundtables arts and poverty 2 focused on the struggles that local artists face and how we as a community can support them and the other roundtable getting the gig was made up of curators and bookers from local festivals and venues like caslo jazz tiny lights touchstones the bc touring council and capitol theater who gave handy tips to any artists applying to galleries theaters and festivals this symposium provided an opportunity for local artists to better their business practice we provided resources that artists can often find difficulty accessing and offer tools that artists rarely take advantage of at zero cost the, through the weekend, we strengthened the knowledge base of our local artists and in doing so, empowered them with skills to be, that will be beneficial to the entire community. Also, in offering a venue for our artists' needs to be heard, we are supporting them, which will only strengthen the cultural climate of our region. And we had 80 people attend that weekend. Oh. Um, the Bigby Place Arts Initiative. In 2017, we partnered with the Kootenai Society for Community Living at Bigby Place. And DAC was able sec to secure funding to create the Bigby Place Arts Initiative, a program that exposes that, a program that exposes adults with developmental disabilities to monthly art classes. These classes vary in genre from month to month and employ local professional artists who lead the 90-minute sessions. So far, we have engaged over 30 adults, which does not include support workers, in abstract art, watercolor, painting, rock and roll, dance, and world musics. We have funding to continue this project into May, and we're going to be sourcing funding to make it happen all again next year, September to May. So it's really, it's great. It's super fun. Uh, we're also offering the Hidden Creek Artist Retreat. So this year will be our third, and the purpose of the retreat is to provide artists with a retreat-style setting in order to work on or develop their art in the areas of visual art, creative writing, or music composition. For one week, artists enjoy a shared residency at Hidden Creek Art and Ecology Retreat at Groman Narrows, all expenses paid. Uh, artists apply and are selected by committee, and the inaugural recipient in 2016 was Corinne Bunshu in Literary Arts, and this is lovely visual artist Kelly Schble from this last year who created that's, it's a puppet. So she pulls a string and that whole dog thing moves. <laughs> Cat thing. Cat thing. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> this isn't on TV or anything, is it? It is. <laughs> oh, right. Financials. Here's the fun stuff, you guys. Get ready. Okay. Oh, it's all piled on top of each other. Awesome. Um, the major sources of our revenue streams this year came from self-generated income, which was 26%, which came through ticket sales, memberships, and commissions. BC Arts Council provided 11%. Uh, BC Gaming was 22%. And the Kootenai Cultural... Uh, Kootenai, Columbia Kootenai Cultural Alliance, sorry, uh, was 19%, although those CKCA funds are used as a flow-through for us, so um, they aren't actually grant monies that we possess. 
Um, uh, CIP grants uh, were 9% of our income. Uh, RDCK grants and city support were 8%. And then I says NDCU grant there on the bottom, number seven, but that is a lie. That is not NDCU. Uh, that's from Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism. Uh, there's also Osprey and West Kootenai Regional Arts Council. So that's 5%, and that was just um, for our rebranding of Art Walk. So that, yeah. Um, so our total revenues for 2017 were $68,534.97. And our expenditures, uh, events were 35% of our expenditures. Operating costs were 8%. Wages and benefits were 41%. And grants and bursaries were 16%. Um, so we're looking to increase our earned revenues in 2018 by an increase in membership and are partnering with other organizations more frequently so as to cost share on projects, alleviating dependence on grant revenue. And the Nelson and District Arts Council respectfully requests funding from the City of Nelson in the amount of $5,000 for our activities in fiscal year 2018. I do completely recognize that that is um, significantly more than the 2.28 inflation percent, um, but 2.5% of $2,500 is $62.50. So um, yeah, and our impact has grown massively. We've gone from you know a, a one-trick pony to providing all these amazing options for professional artists and emerging artists to take advantage of in our community. So we're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and our future planning. Uh, so we're very excited in collaboration with the Nelson Youth Action Committee and Touchstones Nelson. Uh, we are creating the Nelson Youth Arts Action Committee. The mission of this committee is to provide a platform for youth to actively participate in the Nelson, Nel Nelson Arts community by presenting events and projects that serve and showcase young artists and to provide advocacy and visibility for young and emerging artists. The nature of these activities, events, and opportunities will largely be decided and driven by the youth committee members and will be sustained through their own revenues uh, by writing grants, ticketed revenues, etc. The committee has had two meetings to date and have selected a mural as their first project. I did not sway them at all. They decided that on their own. And, uh, and hopefully <laughs> we will be completing that project in June of 2018. And our other future planning, which is very exciting, is the Nelson International Mural Festival. Uh, we're looking forward to producing the first annual Nelson International Mural Festival in August of 2018. Uh, funding permitted, this project will see 10 large-scale works of art created in the downtown core of Nelson, culminating in a three-day celebration of the pieces. Artists will be selected through an application process and will be collaborative with building owners and will abide by the mural policies set forth by the city. The city of Nelson has very generously signed on to support this project, and we are currently fundraising and writing grants like crazy uh, to make sure that this initiative goes ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. This is a snaky. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council, have any questions? Oh, well, thank you for your very enthusiastic <laughs> presentation. <laughs> I'm terrible. I know there's a camera. I'm like, oh, let's try to not do jazz hands. <laughs> Thank you very much. So our next presenter is Tom Thompson and Valerie Yowick who will present the 2018 budget for the Chamber of Commerce. Let's turn it towards this one. Come on over here. So you got a tough act to follow. <laughs> no jazz hands. Oh, you got them, Tom. I know you do. <laughs> that is a tough act to follow. My goodness. So this is actually uh, the Chamber of Commerce has a fee for service contract to operate the visitor center. So this is a uh, visitor center uh, presentation more than the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, many destinations really believe that once a visitor has arrived, you know, the job of, is complete and the economic benefits will start to flow as people start to show up in your community. Attracting new visitors is really only the start of the satisfaction process. Once the visitor arrives, it's vital that the area delivers and exceeds the promises made through all of the outbound marketing that's taking place. You know, the Nelson and Area Visitor Centre is a vital piece in completing the sale. Uh, the staff develops the all-important first impression essentially acting as the welcoming ambassadors for the entire community. And we think uh, coming into the visitor center, we do a pretty good job to begin your experience. It's really a remarkable experience when you uh, work with Destination BC and you try to operate a visitor center. They're trying to get people to move around the entire region. 
when they come to Nelson, we're hopefully hopefully happy to not just welcome them to Nelson, but also send them around throughout E and F and across the into the uh, East Shore and making their length of stay a little bit longer. So the best they can possibly do that is by coming into the visitor center, learning a bit more about the community. These guys, Valerie and the staff that we have down there do a great job of selling the region and spreading better word of mouth and, and increasing the length of stay. Really considered a marketing center as well as we increase awareness of local businesses, shops and services, local and regional amenities, all of the attractions as well as provincial tourism products. By enhancing the quality of visitor experiences by promoting a diverse vacation option for travelers, we do tend to stimulate uh, longer stays that will maximize more economic benefits to the entire area. Valerie, you might want to talk a little bit more about the actual numbers of the visitor center. Uh, this past year, we've seen um, over 20,000 20, visitors come through our doors. Um, an additional 3,000 visitors were looked after um, through roaming, uh, roaming events. We had information on the go tent up, at, up on Baker Street. Um, at the visitor center, we take great pride in our community and local area. It's our pleasure to share information with locals and visitors on things to see and do in our community, shop, explore, eat, and stay in our community. Each year, our new, our new team members uh, goes through extensive training on tourism products, local business, activities and events in the West Kootenays, because we want to share all this information with our visitors, plus locals who don't know of these things. We also tour local businesses and adventure out fitters for the month of June to have a strong understanding of local business, activities and services within our community. Each visitor, we assess the group um, and consider their needs. We want to answer their question and help to customize their experience. We want to, to make it the best. Uh, this summer, our team not only worked on, out of the visitor center, but we had our information on the tent information tent up on Baker Street. We also uh, welcomed um, the, uh, the Elvis. Elvis. We also had the start of the Road Kings car, sh car show down at the Visitor Center, La Carnival. Um, our services were still recognized. Elvis came back to life and <laughs> we helped him. <laughs> Incredible. So um, with the fire situation this past summer, our team had to remain positive because uh, BC was portrayed as burning. So um, we took an approach. We needed to have a special positive approach with our staff on ways to communicate with visitors in an honest and effective way to best answer their concerns. We were faced with things like, uh, is, is Nelson on fire? Is there highway closures, floods? and what is happening. So we wanted to encourage people that, yes, there was smoke in the area, but we wanted to encourage them to still come to visit us. Um, we not only answer face-to-face -face questions, but we um, send out guides um, through provincial, through our provincial guides, answer emails, phone information requests, and social media requests. Uh, this past year, we saw uh, regional vi visitors, which was a combination of locals and visitors in our area, British Columbia, a lot of European visitors because they had their, their holidays booked despite the, the fire situation. And if we could just go to the next one, please. Our numbers were down slightly uh, because of the fire situation. BC was on the media burning. So based on the fire situation and floods in previous years and different weather events, we also sort of act as a crisis center because an awful lot of phone calls come through to the visitor center wondering what's going to happen. And, you know, so we get the walk-in traffic. We get a lot of telephone calls. We get a lot of uh, people coming in and looking for relocation information. We also handle a lot of requests for Nelson Kootenai Lake tourism. They do a lot of great outbound marketing, but when they get into the community, it's really job of visitor center to make sure that they're looking after the, the wants and needs of all of the local people. So our fee for service contract that we've been operating with the city for probably, well, I've been there for 11 years. Uh, there's been probably another 10, 15 years previous to that. 
operate around $76,000 annually. <coughs> We've been running at that number from the city's uh, allocation from 2007 to 2017. So for the last uh, 10 years, we've been staying at that $76,000. We've never really asked for any increase in funding, and we know it's difficult to uh, continue to operate the city on an annual basis and, and keep things fiscally responsible. Uh, but it is difficult to stay at the same level of funding for all of those years. And even as a matter of fact, the year before that, we were reduced by $12,000. So that $76,000, we think we're doing it very uh, fiscally responsibly works out to about $29.25 per hour to operate the visitor center based on the city's contribution. So we tend to subsidize the visitor center as well through the chamber. What all do we provide in 2017? Well, it's a welcoming and vibrant heritage regional visitor gateway. There's a community hub for artisans to showcase all of their product. We expanded hours to stay open through the shoulder seasons, uh, about 300 additional hours this past year. We also provide comprehensive community and regional tourism and business information, as well as information for Kootenai Rockies and throughout the province. We have year-round staffing and trained visitor center counselors, with public washrooms and free visitor Wi-Fi internet access. And we just, uh, this past year, we also worked with Destination British Columbia to provide an electronic kiosk to provide hopefully 24 hour service seven days a week. When we're not there, we hope to be able to put that outside of the building and we hope to be able to provide that outside if we think that we can get by without any serious vandalism. So how much does it cost to run the visitor center? The operating income was $125,234. Uh, there's a full budget that was attached with the presentation. The operating expenses around $151,000. So the excess expense over income is $26,500. Primarily annual expenses are two and a half full-time staff wages, Valerie, uh, Trina Walsh, and Denise McInnes, they're two and a half staff members. There's three seasonal visitor center counselors that work with us during the height of the visitor center uh, visitor season, which is really from May through the end of uh, September. Uh, we also pay municipal taxes, utilities, building and property maintenance, and outbound marketing. So. Those are the key expenses, but really we're in the neighborhood of a $26,000 loss, uh, slightly higher than last year because of the extended hours that we decided to move forward on. So really the space is turning into not just a visitor center, but it's a community space. The station has been a great location for community events from car shows to craft fairs to community meetings. We had the carnival down there celebrating uh, 150 this past summer. We look to continue to build on that. It's a great uh, community space and uh, we're looking forward to continuing on with not only welcoming visitors but also the rest of the community. We think it's a really vibrant hub for the whole community. So really the visitor center, we're all along. Valerie and her staff provide exceptional customer service and a remarkable experience for thousands of visitors and investors annually. The City of Nelson Fee for Service benefits a wide range of businesses, not just the Chamber of Commerce obviously, but retailers, food and beverage providers, artisans, and they all help maintain a vibrant local economy and generate local tax revenue. This represents hundreds of businesses that are employing thousands of Nelson and area residents. Those businesses, the employees, the visitors, and of course the Chamber of Commerce, thank you for your ongoing support and supporting the visitor services uh, that we provide down in uh, Railtown. So thanks very much for your presentation or the opportunity to present tonight. Um, <laughs> Any We're questions? always happy to provide the service to the city and we look forward to working with the city and uh, maybe the regional district, maybe other partners to uh, come up with a way of mitigating some of those excessive uh, costs that we have. Councillor Daly? Two questions I had. Well, how are you funding the excess expense over income? How are we funding it? Yeah, how do you, what do you, how do you pay that? Uh, I take a wage reduction. <laughs> <laughs> no, what we do is uh, we take it, we, through our membership, we have a pretty vibrant membership as well. So we've got over 500 members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, from around the area. And we believe that there are some benefits to being a Chamber member and also operating the Visitor Center. But there's a number of Visitor Centers, a uh, number of Chambers of Commerce around the province that are no longer operating Visitor Centers because of the excess cost. So you, it's funded through the Chamber? We, yeah, we subsidize it through and, the Chamber. And of do you get funding from the RDCK? Uh, not on an annual basis, not on a regular fee for service. We do approach them from time to time for piecemeal pieces. And so if we're doing work on the building, perhaps we've been, we have been receiving some funds perhaps from time to time, but we don't have an annual agreement with either area E or F. 
And so the Nelson Chamber of Commerce members, could they be outside Nelson? Nelson and district. Yeah, right. Okay. So our catchment area goes uh, quite a ways away from, from the city of Nelson itself, and we work with businesses all over. That being said, um, we're, we would, as you know, it's always challenging to work and try to get uh, what we feel to believe are fair and equitable funding solutions for all different types of programming that the city may offer that maybe area E and F or other parts of the regional district could be a part of. That being said, we'll be happy to sit down with uh, your staff and, and our chamber board and, and members of uh, whether it's Tom Newell and Ramona Faust or others and, and see if we can come up with a, a satisfactory solution. Do you, do you make this presentation at the RDCK? We don't make this formal presentation. No, we do. This fee for service is essentially a city of Nelson contract that we have, um, and we will have to expand those services to see if we can get something working with the regional district as well. There's never been, in my understanding, any funding from the regional district. I've been there for 11 years, and there's never been any operating of the visitor center funding. Hmm. Mayor Kozak? Hmm. No, no question. Councillor Purcell? Um, I, I heard you say that the um, number of visitors was down a little bit this year at the smoke. Uh, do, how does it compare with the numbers before you moved into the station? The, uh, in 2015, our numbers were around 16,000 because that was the Hall Street project. So our numbers were down significantly. Uh, 2016, our numbers were around, uh, I believe it was 20. 24,000. Oh, okay. So we've, we've of seen a, a, about a drop of about 4,000 oh, visitors. Okay. Yeah. 2015 to 2016 was difficult to compare because Hall Street, we were shut down for about eight weeks in front of the building, so it was really challenging for people to get to the building sure. or find the visitor center. Yeah, yeah. So that's really not a fair comparison. We're probably in the neighborhood of 21, 22 ish right. on a normal basis. So it's m remained fairly constant uh, uh, other than these. Fairly constant, yes. and I think going into the newer building was obviously a, a benefit the first year. Uh, that is not necessarily the reason why the, the numbers were up, I don't think. I think it's just a more prominent location as well. Mm -hmm. Councillor Adams? Thank you. You said that the city's been contributing $76,000 yes. to the chamber or to the visitor center? It goes to the Chamber of Commerce who operates the visitor center, yes. And But it's been for the last 20 years? No. no increase? Mm -hmm. uh, in no, no, 2006, no. we were, I think probably if you go back, way back, it was probably in the neighborhood of 124,000 at one time. Uh, then that was reduced and reduced and reduced. It got down to 88,000. So the year before I, st I started, which I started in 2007, funding from the city was 88,000. And the first year that I started, it was reduced to 48,000. And I thought, this is a great start. Uh, <laughs> two weeks in, it's like, okay, well, we're, I, I guess I'm out. Uh, so two weeks in, it went down to 48000 and we worked with uh, Kevin and other members of the of administration to get it back up to a $76,000 funding level, and it's remained that way since 2000. Well, it's about time we got an increase. You got an increase. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Council Warmington? Just sorry, just the history of that. At, at the time, the council at the time felt the regional areas should yeah, contribute should. their yeah. share, so yeah. the, the city building. contributed. Um, and I think that's, can you remember the 48,000 now? But um, I think they basically looked at it as the number of, of residents in, in both areas and, and yeah. suggested that our share of their budget should be X and, and the rural area should be X. And, but, um, but a compromise was made to, to raise it up. And again, still waiting on uh, uh, the rural areas to, to participate. Yeah. But the regional district haven't contributed, have they? No, they, they if, Council continues to pay. You know, pay then well, sometimes we don't we don't chamber, necessarily yeah. see see the contribution from the rural area. The chamber and the business, visitor center do an excellent job, and I think perhaps we should consider moving their budget up a little <laughs> bit. They would have to request that. <laughs> <laughs> Council Warming. Um, could you? I'm assuming that you have some sort of arrangement or a relationship with Kootenay Lake Tourism, and I'm just wondering if they could be a financial contributor as well, given that uh, the two percent that they collect actually attracts. Yeah, these that's an interesting question. Uh, the way that the MRDT funding is established is through an order in council from the provincial government, 
and that specifies the content is essentially supposed to be used for outbound marketing. There's a certain amount that is used for administration, but it's very challenging to use money for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. When I was chair of Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism for a couple of years, uh, we were able to establish a small fund, about $10,000 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. It may be higher than that now, but it was around $10,000 that people could apply for infrastructure funding. So if you had a trail in Caslow, for example, and you wanted to put some signage up, if you provided some funding, then Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism could come to the table with a couple of thousand dollars as well. It's limited in scope, and there may be an opportunity for that to be expanded, but I believe that the MRDT numbers are, whoa, look at that thing go. Um, it's really challenging to get that funding allocated towards the operation of the visitor center. Oh, okay. Any other questions, Councilor? No, thank you very much for your presentation, Tom and Valerie, and you did pretty good, all considering. <laughs> <laughs> considering what we had to follow, right? <laughs> Our next presentation is the Capitol Theatre, uh, Executive Director Stephanie Fisher, Treasurer Rob Stacy, and President and Chair of the Board Bessie Wapp will present the Capitol Theatre's 2018 budget. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it's a long presentation. Okay. If you don't talk fast enough, we can give you instructions from Sid. <laughs> you can have her back for some coaching. All right. We'll just do an Italian. Okay, okay we're doing an Italian. <laughs> My name is Stephanie Fisher. I'm the executive director of the Capital Theatre with Miss Bessie Wapp. She's our uh, board president. And Rob Stacy, who is our treasurer. <laughs> Thanks Yay. for coming. Yeah, thanks for having us for that uh, presentation. <coughs> okay. Rob, you're up. All right. Uh, please see our financial statements 2017 in your package. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the city for their annual operating funding to the Capitol Theatre. Funding enables us to deliver cultural services on behalf of the city to our community, youth, and visitors. As you see in the pie chart, 14% of our global budget comes from the city. However, last fiscal year, we also spent $61,800, or 13% in maintenance, utilities, fiber, water, and sewer, which did not leave a lot for wages and benefits or program delivery. Now, as you see on page three of the financial statements, we had an overall revenue decrease of $11,000 due to lower donations and slightly lower rental income. Our overall expenses were up by $13,000, which was mostly due to increased spending on building maintenance. The Society continues to invest any surplus into building upgrades and renovations to bring our wonderful community theatre up to date um, to 2020. Our net revenue for the year was $323. Yay! That's great. <laughs> <laughs> a very important figure is under the heading Unrestricted Net Assets. This figure represents that the Capital Theatre is in a surplus position of $18,666. This surplus has been earmarked to match further funding for facility improvement grants in fiscal year 2018 and 2019. Uh, as you can see, we well, have to go to the revenue. Mm -hmm. yeah. As you can see on this slide, 79% of our revenues come from earned income and other sources. Yay! <laughs> Theatre operations in 2016-2017, we hosted 114 performances. Uh, if you want to translate this into providing entertainment, 365 days a year, we provided 3.2 performances per week. Naturally, our season 
uh, with most performances is from middle of September to middle of June, which means that, for example, this February and March, we will be hosting 23 events and performances. Hosting a performance often does not mean that it just takes place on that one evening for larger presentations. We have one day of pre-hang before the performance dates so a load in, day of the show, the so load out, day of the show, and then one day of restore after the performance date. If you add up hours to positions, we have three full-time and one part-time position managing the daily life at the theater like managing all the 114 performances, the pre and post tanks, um, managing in, in general the operations, uh, the performance weeks, which is separate from performances, so some moved in for a whole week, so everything has to be managed there. Uh, our rental contracts, marketing, tech support, grant writing, project and program management, custodial, season bookings, maintenance, and everything that's involved in uh, two large theater productions, which we do every year. And of course, the list goes on. So we spend around 30, we, or we spend 31% of our budget on staff. And none of our staff are paid even close uh, to the provincial median income for culture workers. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the Capitol Theater's uh, vision. Oh, we have to go to yeah. the next slide. Yeah. The Capitol Theater's vision is to enrich community through the arts, and city funding is essential to offset some of our operating costs. We achieve our vision by providing a facility for the performing and visual arts, providing leadership in the performing arts serving as a performing arts resource and referral facility for the community, and providing instruction and opportunity to pr practice theater arts and related skills. And the Capitol Theater Restoration Society takes great pride in maintaining a facility for all to use and enjoy. Um, we are thankful to all our funders who support the arts and culture in Nelson across the region, province, and Canada. Their funding offsets costs for presenting, touring, production, and youth and community engagement. And as you can see, we had uh, quite an active year with, uh, with presenting uh, 20 companies, like 88 actors and support staff. We did our usual two house uh, productions and community engagement, which we had actively 400 uh, people uh, uh, being there and 750 uh, in the audience and support coordinators. Um, grants are often program and project driven and if at all we can usually only use a small percentage towards operating funding, wages and benefits and maintenance costs. We would love to provide more community programming. However, without a significant increase in our operating funding for additional staffing or an increase in staff hours, we will for now remain at our current capacity. I would just like to reiterate that uh, City of Nelson funding, whether it's operating or toward building improvements, is essential to accessing funding from other levels of government your funding is very important and we thank you for that. Our volunteers are essential to running our front of house and we thank them for their commitment providing their services punctually and reliably show after show. We'd also like to thank our funders, sponsors and donors who support the theatre year after year because they believe in the work we are all doing and see the importance of providing live performing arts to all ages. And we are thankful to our fellow board members who keep the organization on track and in all aspects of running a nonprofit organization and according to our strategic plan and as you see on the slide don't shy away from being hands-on <laughs> thanks also go to the artists who create year after year uh, to bring their work to our theater 
Every year we program an annual uh, season series and our audience rewards us for our choices by attending the shows and becoming subscribers. We pay uh, professional artist fees and support live performing artists by providing a well-maintained stage, up-to-date sound and lighting equipment, clean dressing rooms, accommodation and hospitality and technical support. Um, last year, we had an audience turn up out of 7,950 people to our series. Building new audiences is essential to staying current and sustainable in the future. With our family-friendly programming, we attract youth as young as four years old to the theater. We often see that the live theater experience has a profound impact on their imagination. In this time of screen-based entertainment, we believe that live acting and interacting with artists on stage is becoming more and more essential for youth of all ages to develop imagination and creativity. Uh, we also uh, collaborate with the Nelson Overture Concert Society on their classical music series, which is uh, often like four classical music performances. Two years ago, we launched our live performance on the screen. Uh, we're building slowly an audience for those screens that show live presentations in theater and dance for major performing arts theaters. What we hear back from our audience is that every time they attend one of the screenings, they feel like they're right there with the audience in New York or London. Our audience is of all ages, and every year we attempt to program the tried and true for our uh, stable uh, audience that comes out every year, as well as challenging our audience with new contemporary theater experiences. And of course, everybody has fun at the theater. Uh, those youth hip hoppers uh, were part of the Project Soul Outreach program we offered last year. And performers who come to Nelson love our theater and spread the word about Nelson's arts community. I often hear that they would love to live and work here. But short of being able to do that, they enjoy eating at local restaurants and going shopping on Maple Street. Our mandate is to provide a community rental facility, and we put a lot of effort <coughs> into doing just that. The facility is used by many groups from professionals to schools and everybody in between. Currently, we have the lowest rental rates in our region compared to Vernon, Trail, Cranbrook, Golden, and Revelstoke. <coughs> Most of those facilities are also city-owned and maintained, and I will update you on my findings in the months to come. Every year, we try our best to keep the rental rates low this year, we are taking a closer look at our rates and will most likely increase rental rates across the board to keep up with uh, the increasing costs of maintaining and running the theater. And we offer, of course, a variety of rentals from half day to full day to weekly. As most of you probably know, the pantomime is a theater staple of Nelson's live performing arts for everyone. We have full houses in support of the community pantomime every year. Here's a comment from one panto participant. It is no secret that Nelson is full of talent. For a small town, our performing arts community is thriving, both on stage and in the theater seats. Even the amateurs get their five minutes. I'm so thankful for the opportunity and experience the Capitol Theatre provides its patrons and supporters each year through the annual pantomime production. Last year in particular, I joined a cast of amazing individuals from all walks and sang and danced my heart out alongside my sister, niece, and daughter. Thank you to the Capitol for giving back to the community through these incredible memory-making opportunities. Our summer youth program is one of a kind and the annual production of a musical, our annual production of a musical is high caliber and enjoyed by the community. We have full houses in support of the young performers. Here are a couple of comments from youth participants. I think one of the most important reasons why this program is needed at the Capitol Theater is for kids like myself and especially for homeschool students, 
It's really the only youth theater option. Mm -hmm. I learned many things at the program last year, including harmony, directing, how to work under pressure, and how to strengthen my acting, singing, and dancing abilities. This program was one of the best experiences of my life, and it's very, very beneficial for all youth. I enjoyed how supportive and professional it was, how many friends I made, the directors, the crew, and the show we put on. It was Julia Halbert. Here's a second comment. I feel unimaginably privileged to have been able to be part of this program for the last three years running, and I cannot possibly express my depths of gratitude to the theater, to the artistic and technical staff, and to all those who make this program possible, as it has given me everything. Three years ago, this program provided me with the spark that has set me down the path of becoming a professional performing artist, inspiring me fundamentally. I could not ask for a more professional and supportive environment. That's from Quinn Barron. In conjunction with presenting uh, professional artists, we offer community and youth, youth outreach, taking advantage of what the professional artists bring uh, in to Nelson and can offer in regards to workshops and talks. This program is very rewarding. However, since we offer those programs free of charge or for a very small fee to keep them barrier free, we subsidize them with our earned revenue. And here you can just see uh, the amount of students like Project Soul was a very successful outreach program with 550 students participating. Mm -hmm. And then we had all our other workshops and post and pre uh, show talks. And here are a few images of uh, the Project Soul on the top and then just us having fun. <laughs> Uh, this is when our executive director switches to project manager for the, for the facility, which Stephanie does regularly and very well. Um, since 2013, the Capitol Theatre has undertaken a multitude of capital projects to bring the 30-year-old theatre up to date. Uh, we continued improvements last fiscal year and are thankful for the city's and the regional district's financial support that enabled us to match or triple or quadruple your contributions. Yeah, and here are some, some images of uh, what we did from installing a new HVAC in the annex to restoring the stage and the entrance to the stage and new HVAC and more furniture. Yeah, and new stage surface. It's new pretty pit, exciting. Yeah. New pit, pit, new orchestra pit. So pretty exciting stuff. This year we're asking for a 4% increase to our operating funding and to offset cost of inflation throughout all budget lines from increases to accommodation, maintenance, artist fees, supplies and travel to production materials, professional memberships and advertising. You're correct. So what's coming up? The Capitol Theatre was 90 years old in 2017. And this year, we are also celebrating the Capital Theater 30th season. We are continuing our diverse programming and outreach with a focus on indigenous engagement. We'll continue facility upgrades as grants become available and according to the city's building feasibility study <coughs> recommendations. And I gave you a little packages there with some of the upcoming uh, shows we have on stage. Uh, and included in that program is a fabulous show coming up to celebrate our 30th anniversary. We will have artists from all genres volunteering their time in support of this celebration. So come out and join the fun on March 10th. There will also be surprises and prizes. Last but not least, we encourage you to join our e-newsletter and Facebook page to stay up to date on all events at the Capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Council Warmington. I have a couple of questions actually. Um, are you connected to Nelson Fiber? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Um, and could you 
tell me where the regional district contribution came from? From uh, Ramona Faust. From Area E? Mm -hmm. Not from Area F. Nothing. And from Area F, Tom Newell. Area E and F. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I look forward to going on March 10th. Yeah. Great. And I also would like to draw your attention to uh, a theater play we are bringing in from Vancouver. What does reconciliation mean to you? It's called Home by David Diamond, and it will be uh, one of our capital off-site events. We just started last year with a new series of off-site, and this year we will have two. One is this one, and the other one is a, a choir with Alison Gervin at the uh, hockey arena. So we hope to fill the arena with a thousand people to sing together. Together. Yeah. This says it's going to be at LV Rogers. That's right. Yeah. The the other the one at the hockey arena is with Allison Gervin. It's a choral. It's, it's a, a, choral it's a choir. Thing. It's a different thing than this. It's not this. Oh, it's a different thing. Oh, it's sorry. That's it. LV Rogers. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank I got to keep again. reading. Thank you. He's like a sponge. So last but not least, we have Touchstones Nelson Museum of Arts and History and uh, recently appointed Executive Director Astridge. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to attempt your last name. I'll mess it up. <laughs> How do you say it? I'll help you out. This one. We'll present the 2018 budget for Touchstones Nelson Museum of Arts and History. Good evening. My name is Astrid Herdahl. I'm the executive director of Touchstones Nelson. So somewhat recently, it's been about a year that I've, just over a year that I've been at Touchstones, and it's been a very busy and wonderful year. So first I want to start by thanking you so much for the opportunity to present and to say that we are truly grateful for the city's support of Touchstones Nelson. Our board of directors, our staff, our volunteers, thank Mayor Kozak and Council, and all citizens of Nelson who support the important work undertaken by Touchstones. It is the city's and this district's museum, gallery, and archives. We have existed as an organi organization since 1955, and in 2006 we opened our doors as touchstones in the city's stunning 1902 Heritage Building. For the last decade and a bit, we've been a thriving organization, and we, we believe that our work continues to be important to the community, and that now, more than ever, we are truly responding to the needs and shifts in our society. So I got a little heavy in this presentation. I wanted to talk a little bit beyond just Touchstones Nelson and talk a little bit about the arts and heritage sector across Canada. I've also, of course, brought in our uh, economic uh, impact study from 2003, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about that before we move on to specifics about Touchstones. And it's just really a comment about the value of arts and heritage is truly an ongoing conversation around the world, but more so in North America, especially now. I wanted to take the opportunity to say that we are not alone in our discussion here tonight. The value of arts and heritage is still debated, even though we have so much information that proves to us that we are indeed tangibly and intangibly vital. In this slide, I've presented you with information gathered by the Canadian Museums Association in 2014, and uh, it gives us some figures to read through in order to understand the economic impact of the arts and of the uh, CMA and bodies across the country to t continue to do these studies so that we can offer a financial, tangible understanding of the arts and heritage sector. I won't read all the points here, but one point um, that I wanted to mention is that across Canada, the direct economic impact of culture is 61 billion and is 10 times larger than that of sport, which is 6 billion. So the economic impact study of arts and heritage was last done in 2003. This really states that we need a new uh, study so that we can look truly at what it is that this sector does for our community. So Nelson specific, although it's outdated, we can still uh, have a bit of a reminder of what the economic impact of the sector is. So just starting to talk about the fact that the economic impact of the combined existence of arts and heritage is $75 million, and that's a 2003 figure. And it's about uh, just under 3,000 jobs. I'm sure it's over 3,000 now in 2018. 
The principal beneficiaries of the arts economy are not specifically the members of the arts community, but rather all residents of Nelson, particularly those in the hospitality industry who gain from tourism spending. And the fact that we are known as the best small arts town in North America draws people to us. So now we get into the specifics of Touchstones. So in 2017, we welcomed more people in our doors with programs, events, exhibition openings, outreach into the community, and more. We are very proud to say that this past year, we have heard many, many times that there is a renewed sense of vibrancy at Touchstones, that we are now fully growing into our name as the cornerstone, the touchstone, and the hub of art and culture and heritage in Nelson. Touchstones renewed, we've, uh, you know, hand in hand with this renewal and with sort of standing room only for many of our programs is the new vision and mission statements that were revised by the board in 2017. All programs, events, and exhibitions at Touchstones are guided by these statements. Vision and mission alignment is paramount for us. Our new vision is an inclusive society inspired by the convergence of art and history. And our mission is to be the cultural hub that provides integrative art and regional history programs to encourage new perspectives and foster a collaborative community. Now it's going a little bit beyond we house old stuff. Yes, the archives are absolutely essential in housing and maintaining. The collection is vital um, to hold our tangible history. But more so, it's really about bringing the community together and creating programs that uh, shape the way that we think about things, that uh, create a sense of collaboration, that have challenging conversations where we can create a safe space in the museum to do so with um, all ages, children to adults. So the value specifically of Touchstones, I want to talk a little bit about stats from 2017. We've talked about the broader sector across Canada and BC, but let's talk really about our museum. We welcomed over 15,000 people to Touchstones in 2017. And I think that's really significant, um, especially since there was such a dip in tourism in uh, this past year, and we still had 1,500 more people than we did in the previous year. So we're still growing, our admissions are growing, membership is growing, everything has really grown this past year, and I think that speaks to what it is that we're doing at Touchstones. We also support the community. We are paying local and regional artists, artisans, and offer authors. We paid over 35000 by selling their work in our shop and over $18,000 to artists through CARFAC fees, um, through exhibitions and programs. And CARFAC is the, the body that governs artist fees across the country so that artists can get fair wages for their work. You can look through all of these stats and understand the economic impact of the arts and heritage, but it's challenging to measure the intangibles the joy experienced by viewers in the museum and in the exhibitions, the knowledge and love of history instilled in a child and their family. These are the things that are so hard to place a number on. And it's the reason I get up in the morning, is to ensure that I can create a better society and that I can participate in really bringing joy to people's lives through art and through history. Visitors to Nelson often come through our doors to learn more about where they're staying and to bring home a unique piece of Nelson with them in the form of a book, a mug, a painting, or a tea towel from our shop. The majority of visitors are truly surprised and so impressed with the quality of Touchstones. It is an unexpected jewel in a town of 10,000 people. It is a truly amazing place that we should all be very proud of. This is amazing to hear these comments from visitors from afar. and. Um, What's really important is also to see what, what are our members saying? What are the people of this community saying about Touchstones? And I'll read just one from Thomas Lowe. I am a Touchstones member because I want to continue to support all the arts and culture programs that Touchstones offers. I see arts and culture as an integral part of the well-being of our community. It is one of many great things that makes Nelson what it is, and most importantly, it keeps us all human. And I think that's a really important statement for us to think about today when we think about the value of all of these organizations that are presenting tonight. So we'll talk about community impact. What is it that we did in 2017? We had 11 exhibitions in 2017 showcasing the work of local, regional, and Canadian artists. And uh, the gallery was really a buzz. We were um, having more and more people come to our gallery openings and artist talks and more and more we're offering free programs to our members and to our community. Um, artist talks, curator talks, 
behind the buildings, behind the scenes tours with, you know, historians like Ron Wellwood and all these sorts of things to really draw the community in and to blow open the doors a little bit more than what was done in the past. So we had Tanya Pixie Johnson, George A. Mears, Jack Shadbolt, um, an incredible BC artist. This was a touring show that we had from the Burnaby Art Gallery. We had a really phenomenal exhibition uh, called Train Dreams, which was a video installation piece which converged art and history. So taking archival photographs and melding it with contemporary film installation was really remarkable and touched both those interested in contemporary art and history and heritage, which is something that we're really trying to do more is that convergence piece. Uh, in addition, we had a really exciting and important show called River Relations, which discussed the Columbia River and um, the impacts of damming that river. And in conjunction with that, we showcased Roll on Columbia, which was our 2015 Canadian Museums Association award-winning show. We brought that back out to pair with the show, and we're hoping that Roll on Columbia will actually tour in 2018 and 2019 along with River Relations. So that show will be going to Grand Forks, we know for sure, and we're hoping that it'll go across BC. So the work that we do in 2015 actually is still having an impact onwards, which is phenomenal. We also, this is a show, um, an image of River Relations. And then also working with um, the Indigenous community to showcase their work. We have um, uh, Tyler Wright showcased here. He is a young emerging Indigenous artist who had his work on display at the gallery. And then more and more we're doing exhibitions in our what's called our community collections space, ensuring that um, young emerging artists as well as community collections can be showcased in our space beyond just gallery A and B. So expanding our <laughs> a capacity within the building as well is something that we're really focused on. So we had over 35 programs in 2017, which is a massive, massive jump from previous years. And I believe that, again, there's just a massive community impact as a result. So we started off 2017 with Yoga in the Gallery, which was a really successful program um, due to sort of some staff changes and then the yoga instructor that we were working with went on maternity leave. So we had to <laughs> shut the program down for just a little bit, but we're really happy to announce that we're having it again in February and we'll have a few ongoing this year. We've had poetry workshops, Heritage Week, we're focusing more and more, wanting to do free admissions. It does cut down on our earned revenues, but at the same point brings in the community more. So it's a really important um, part of our new vision and mission statement. The board is very uh, adamant that we make this organization more accessible and free in some cases. Had film screenings, concerts. We brought in Oliver Swain to have a, a concert in our space. Um, we had uh, we participate in Art Walk as we do every year. We participate in uh, Road Kings, and we did Pride workshops this year. Uh, we had Songs and Lament in recognition of Asian Heritage Month, which packed our lobby. We had 150 people on standing room only. It was a really incredible uh, event that we had, and we are taking it to the next level in collaboration with Capitol Theater, uh, Civic Theater, um, the Langham, and um, the Nikkei um, Tournament Center. Uh, Memorial Center. We're hopefully doing another program in uh, May if we get grant funding. We're just waiting on that grant. So again, always working collaboratively to ensure that we can share resources and increase our um, community impact. What's really important for the museum ongoing is uh, truth and reconciliation and responding to the calls of action uh, from the TRC. So one of the events that we did was celebrate um, Orange Shirt Day, wanting to ensure that people are coming into the museum space not only to learn about um, specific Nelson history, but look, looking at Canadian history. And um, so we had a Truth and Reconciliation PowerPoint presentation with an Indigenous educator. And we had a small but very dedicated and wonderful group and had an amazing conversation. And these are the kinds of things that we're going to be doing more and more in 2018 onwards. I wanted to point out one program that we had this past year that was exceptionally successful. Museum MASH is our new family program. And um, it's a, changing the model of past programs slightly and contemporizing it. We had over 350 people attend in November 2017. It was utter madness and it was one of the better days that we've had at Touchstones. We had children 
of all ages participate in everything from photography, crafts, hands-on workshops, puppet theater. Um, they listen to the ukuleles, which are pictured here on the left, and listen to a, a barbershop chorus sing many um, history songs. It was a really incredible event, and uh, we're really looking forward to doing that now twice a year. And what's phenomenal about these kinds of programs is that we do um, have the capacity to get program grants for these, especially for youth programs. The funding bodies um, provincially, federally are really excited about funding these kinds of programs and so it's really great that we're able to increase our capacity in these areas. I want to talk about the bunker. So in addition to programming and exhibitions in 2017, we, have, we are working on the bunker. Um, this project has been in the works for years by past staff and board and from the city. And in 2017, there was finally some really amazing movement. Our lease is now signed. Thank you to all of the players in this room and who made that happen. It was really uh, quite exciting to have those papers fully signed. And I'm happy to announce that the first phase of renovation, which is the life and safety upgrades, such as asbestos abatement, emergency exits, and new washroom facilities, have been completed. And 60% of the collection has been moved from 42 Anderson into the bunker. I got some round of applause. That's, yeah, it's been a long time in the making. <laughs> We're very excited. So Jean-Philippe Stian is our archivist and collections manager, and he was able to move 60% of the collection uh, recently, and the rest of the 40% will be moved in the spring, and therefore the city may have that building back, and you may do with it as you will. <laughs> so I know that's really wonderful for all of us, that we can move forward and ensure that this bunker space, which was sort of a a forgotten little space in the basement of the Gray Building is going to become a really vital part of Test Jones Nelson in that our collection can be stored there with proper HVAC museum standards so that our collection is preserved for posterity. And it's also going to be an exhibition space and workshop space so that the public can use it. We can open up the doors as a heritage site. We received funding from CBT actually to do a lot of this work and transform it into a space where school students can come in, where we can have film screenings in partnership with organizations in the community, where we can have, you know, um, bunker sessions, so concerts in the basement, uh, sort of small intimate concerts. Uh, it'll be a capacity of 60 people in that space. So we're really looking forward to see that uh, officially launch in the fall of 2018 and to see what we can do. We're waiting on a few more grants to see if we can uh, build a tunnel <laughs> from the museum into the bunker space and we will keep you informed of those um, of those grants coming in. So I'll let you know about our 2018-2020 uh, plan in addition to the bunker. We've been working diligently to develop our 2018-20 plan. It's bold and yet obtainable and uh, you'll see here on the slide that the next two years we will continue to see our vision and mission realized in new programs and exceptional exhibitions. And we also have a clear focus on the building on 502 Vernon. General maintenance and upgrades along with increasing its capacity for public use and ensuring that everyone in Nelson and all visitors know that we are a museum at first sight. So looking at the visibility of the building and then also ensuring that we are really doing our part to maintain this stunning space. and. Um, try and do projects like the third floor is a full administrative space and I'm sure that it could be used for more public. If we can just get some more grant money to ensure that we can change that space into an educational hub. So some of our priorities, we have a whole list here of programs that we are going to be doing. Um, one that we're really, really looking forward to is the Truth and Reconciliation and Archives panel discussion. So we're going to be working with a lot of local and regional partners, Indigenous communities in the area to um, respond to the calls, the TRC calls to action specific to archives. So as an organization we have the archives, the museum and the gallery which all have specific calls to action and we are responding to all of them in turn and ensuring that we're really doing so diligently so that we can uh, humanize um, our archives and ensure that we are following all of the protocol there. So it's really a discussion about how Touchstone Stelson is moving forward and how we can assist other museums that may be a little bit smaller than us to move forward in this direction as well. We are refreshing our school programs. I've just received some funding to start an Indigenous Worldview School program where we are hiring Indigenous educators in order to create the program. And um, we're expanding our exhibitions. We're creating a permanent art station for children called the Art Lab, and that will be opening up in the summer. Uh, we are going to be working with the City of Nelson to improve our garden and entry on Vernon Street. 
And um, what I really want to talk about here as well is the financial sustainability and growth is a key strategic direction for the organization ongoing, not just for the next two years, but <laughs> into the future. Specifically, it's our goal to increase our operating funds from the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, and the RDCK. In particular, I understand from Council that you would like to see the RDCK support the organizations and facilities that are in Nelson and also serve the areas outside of Nelson. Over the last few weeks, Jean-Philippe Stien, Touchstone's archivist and collections manager, has been generating reports on our collection and our archives, indicating what objects are specific to each area. And I will work with the board of directors at Touchstones to make our case to RDCK with the hopes that they will further support our work with operating funds. Area E will support Touchstones with an operating grant of $5,000 in 2018. And uh, with an election year, we'll see what happens. But I'm hoping that ongoing, we can work with the Touchstones board and with the RDCK to really see the value of what it is that we do, not only for Nelson, but also for the area. So just um, wanted to let you know, in addition to new and returning programs and our strategic direction, we want to showcase the work we're doing in the galleries in 2018. Aaron Fay, the curator at Tess Jones, has planned a wonderful 2018 exhibition season. The exhibitions are exceptionally relevant, intriguing, and truly add not only to the experience of people visiting Touchstones, but they add to Canadian culture, art, and academia. We have an impact beyond Nelson. Upcoming exhibitions in Gallery A this year are She, We, They, The Women Show. So this is a history show that's looking at women in Nelson, the history of feminism, and it is an inclusive show, just talking about some of the prominent women we've had in Nelson in the past and currently have. Uh, Ready Player Two with Sonny Yasu and Brendan Tang. Uh, these are two very, very prominent artists from BC, so it's really exciting to be able to bring them here to Nelson. And I think it'll draw not only a crowd from Nelson, but also outside of Nelson to, to come in to see these two artists. In the summer, we're going to have a History of Mountain Biking show. So I'm very excited. I'm curating this show with the community. It's truly a community curated um, exhibition where it is a table full, a room full of mountain bikers creating a show and I'm going to help them visualize the history. So it's going to be, again, a draw for not just individuals and members who've come to Touchstones Nelson all the time, but it's really about drawing in new audiences who've perhaps never stepped into the museum before. And the last show in Gallery A for 2018 is called Lost Thread, and it is going to be a really wonderful textile exhibition, which pushes open the boundaries of what textile is. And the programming for this show is going to be really exceptional in that it's everything from, you know, quilting circles and knitting circles to, you know, knitting hats for preemies and then going beyond um, those kinds of traditional things and looking at what it is that textiles can do now and how has that shifted. And this is an area where we can really add to Canadian culture and academia and looking at bringing some of these artists from Canada and from BC and joining them together for new conversations. In Gallery B this year, we have four shows, Policy Sesquasis, Indigenous Archive Photo Project. Uh, Policy Sesquasis is a journalist, um, kind of now an archivist, and artist, an activist who has undertaken a photo project over the last two years, and this is the first time that it's going to be shown in a gallery space anywhere across Canada. And this show has looked at archives across Canada, Indigenous archives across Canada, and he's gone through a process of reclaiming those photographs and humanizing those photographs. So he's posted them online and asked people in the community, do you know this individual? Let's give them a name, um, as opposed to a label of you know, you know, unknown person by rock. You know, it's just something about wanting to showcase really positive, beautiful, resilient images that um, he feels are very, very important for the indigenous community as well as us as the settler community. And that is when, um, as a part of that exhibition, we are doing the TRC panel um, and archives. Um, <laughs> DJ Olive, Listening to Fur, is going to be another um, exhibition that we have. DJ Olive is a world-renowned DJ who happens to live in Nelson. He's going to be doing a really interesting soundscape for us. So it's a site-specific soundscape in Gallery B. Uh, Heather Benning is an um, artist from the Prairies, and she'll be doing a show called Field Doll. And uh, you'll see this doll on your top left corner in uh, site-specific photographs around Nelson. So we've... Yes, I'll keep some of that a surprise. So they'll be, it'll, be really, it'll be really intriguing to see what we can pull up. So we're going to be doing that. Pardon me? Is that like a big elf on the shelf? Kind of, yeah. It's going to be, it's, it's a massive, massive doll. And then it, the doll itself is going to be on display in Gallery B. It's going to be whimsical and possibly a little creepy as well, which is just so phenomenal a combination. 
Uh, now, the last show that we'll have in Gallery B is all about 402 Anderson. So as I said, the bunker is moving forward. We're moving the collection out of our old museum space at 402 Anderson. And that site holds with it a lot of history and so we're going to be focusing on the history of that Nicole Tremblay is going to come in as our guest curator and do that show for us so after telling you all about 2017 what we've done and telling you our future plans for 2018 I wanted to talk first about sort of the value uh, of what we do and, and enhance uh, the region as well as Canadian art and culture this year from our 2017 contribution which is the same rate as 2015 we're asking for a 2% increase in 2017, $75,000, which is 22% of this grant, went towards building costs. So building maintenance, uh, utilities, taxes. 78% remaining went to staff. We have six staff, none of whom have extended benefits, um, and only three of whom make Nelson living wages. And we are working on changing this for 2018 so that we can ensure that all six staff at Touchstones Nelson receive um, are valued for the work that they do. So our 2018 budget, I've outlined here for you, looking at where we'll receive grants and funding from the feds, the province, municipal, and the region. Um, areas for increase, I really see for not 2018, because there's a lot of background work to do, but for 2019 is the BC Gaming Grant. The BC Gaming Grant that we have is $12,000 right now. It's very low considering our size of our organization. So this is something that we really, really need to get up. And this is a, it's a board goal, it's a personal goal. We will see this happen and um, hopefully in 2019. And, um, and then it'll just go up from there. So those are the areas of growth that I really see. And then those programmatic grants, um, it's, it's, it's challenging. As Stephanie Fisher mentioned in her presentation, program grants are phenomenal to increase the capacity of programs, but they give very limited amount for administration, for program development fees, for overhead. And so without that staff capacity, it's very hard to actually do those programs. Um, so here in a uh, lovely little pie charts, we have our projected revenue and expenses for 2018. So if we were to receive the incre increase in the grant, the municipal grant would cover 44%, and then we would have earned revenue 26%, contributed revenue of nine, so contributed revenue being um, private donations and um, sponsorship, and then grants 21%. And then our expenses, 45% are wages, 11% programs and exhibitions, and administration we keep as low as we can at, uh, oh, nope, sorry, 12% is programs and exhibitions, administration is 11, that's fine. <coughs> okay. And you'll see that 16% is utilities and, bu and building maintenance. So in 2017, we had 41% of our expenses were wages, 15% uh, utilities and building maintenance, programs and exhibitions, and administration, both sitting at 14 and 12. Wanted to give a comparison from what we've done from 2013 to 2018. Now, in 2017, I want to say that not all of the grants have been accounted for. So I haven't listed all the grants as they actually can't all be accounted for revenue in that some of the funds will be reserved for the continuation of programs and projects in 2018. However, I still wanted to let you know the number from 2017. So excluding contributions from the city, we received over $169,000 in grant money. So that's from foundations, regional funding, provincial funding, and federal funding. And this is a number that I see growing with my dedication to grant writing with a really great staff team and a board team behind us. We are gonna to continue to increase and um, diversify our funding. The operating grant that we received from the City of Nelson is incredible and we thank you so much for allowing us to be a sustainable organization that can make a real difference in the community. We are able to have this operating grant um, and then use that to leverage other funding, be it from the region, uh, the province, or the feds, and we're really looking forward to making Teststones Nelson even more vibrant in 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Does council have any questions or comments? Good presentation. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much for your presentation. No questions. No hard questions? I was ready for them. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your hard work. Yeah. Yeah.
I guess move to adjourn. Yep. I have a move. Uh, somebody move adjournment. Councilor Purcell seconded by Mayor Kozak. All in favor? Are we going back in camera? Opposed? Yeah. No. 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 Are we yeah. still have in camera? Yeah, I think I think we'll let Kevin finish his report. And we got what, like a we ten have, minute break or something. 